Good morning. May we please stand for the reading of the Word of God. I will be reading from Isaiah uh, chapters 8 through 9. Uh, if you have it, just say amen. Okay. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever and all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. You've brought us safely through another week. And we're grateful that we can be together today. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit, speak to our hearts, and thank you that you are with us and have promised to never leave or forsake us. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have ever been to a wedding that started late? <laughs> Everyone? <laughs> I think almost every wedding starts late. I won't ask you how late your wedding, if you've been married before, started. Mine was 45 minutes late. The reason was, well, we, were, we got married in the middle of COVID and we were live streaming the wedding so that our friends and family who weren't able to be there, because we had a certain number of people we could have there um, legally, so we wanted our friends and family to be able to be there, and so we wanted to live stream it. And we were live streaming it to YouTube, and unfortunately, somewhere in the YouTube universe, if you search for whatever my name, you'll find me there, saying, I'm so sorry, but the live stream isn't working. Please go to my Facebook page and you can probably catch it there. Oh, that was such a, a I don't know, it, it was just a, a, kind of annoying. 45 minutes, we were trying to get the live stream to work and our poor pianist played everything she could think of while we were waiting. <laughs> oh. The, da the, the, the worst part of it was that I'm told, we found out later that when people did get to Facebook to watch the live stream, I had intentionally set up my Facebook so that it was public, but apparently live streams are never public. So only people who were already friends with me could see it live, which meant that Sarah's grandparents who her grandmother had cancer at the time and they weren't able to travel, had to watch it later. Weddings often start late. I kind of wonder though what it was like for the people who were actually waiting for the wedding to start. Because I was running around trying to figure out how to get things started. I was busy. But the people in the pews, they weren't busy. They were wondering, what is taking so long? You've thought those thoughts, and I have too. You know, did the bride not show up? Did somebody, you know, just, are we waiting for someone important? Um, what are we waiting for? Waiting, waiting, waiting. Jesus told a story about waiting for a wedding. And we're going to look at that today. Before we, we get into that story, I want to give just a little bit of background. We've been looking, last time we started this series about what are God's people expected to do. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, what are God's expectations for us? Because it's good to know expectations before we go into something, right? So, what does he expect? And we, look, we, we said that there are three things in, from Revelation. 
that the Bible tells us that God's people are supposed to do as we wait for Jesus to come. We are called to wait. Guess what we're talking about today? To witness and to worship. Wait, witness, and worship. So today we'll be talking about waiting. I know we talked about that a little bit last time, but today we'll talk about waiting, and we're going to look at that story that Jesus tells us about what it means to wait. Um, For the sake of, uh, let's see, if I could ask for one one request, um, the back projector is cycling through lots of different things, and I have ADD, and I'm going to get distracted. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Okay, so last time we talked about waiting in Scripture, and we talked about how God is calling his people to patiently endure. If you were here, we learned a new word in Greek. It was the word hupomone. Now I can't say it. Hupomone. It means to wait, to patiently endure, to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances. God calls us to run the race with endurance, to get rid of whatever sins are weighing us down. We had Anthony up here trying to run with weights in his hands. It didn't, doesn't work very well. And God calls us to do the same thing, to drop the things that are holding us back so that we can follow him and to keep our eyes on Jesus. And then in a surprise, we saw that Jesus himself did what he now asks us to do. He endured the cross for you and for me. That was the introduction to this idea. And today, we're going to take a look at the idea of waiting. And I want to just give you a little bit of a background. The story we're going to look at comes from Matthew chapter 25. The book of Matthew records five major sermons that Jesus preached. The first one you probably are most familiar familiar with, it's the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. The second one are Jesus' instructions that he gave to his disciples before sending them off on their first missionary journey. Number three is a series of parables about the kingdom of heaven. You, you, you recognize these parables if I, I told them. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted seeds in the ground. Some fell on rocky soil. Some fell on the thorns. You know the stories. That was the third big sermon that Jesus preached that Matthew records. The fourth one is found in Matthew 18. That one concludes with the parable of the unforgiving servant. You know, the one that got forgiven like the national debt and then he went and almost choked the guy for not giving him 10 bucks. That's how Jesus ended that fourth sermon. But the final one is what we'll be spending time on today and also next time as well. This is a sermon that where Jesus teaches about the end times. Appropriate for today, I think, because as I look at the Bible and I look through history, everything in the big, all the clues that we find in the Bible point to the idea and the truth that we're living near the end. We're living in the end. So how are God's people supposed to live if we're at the end? We're going to take a look at that a little bit today. So are you, Matthew 25 is where we'll be at, but I want you to turn one page over if you have to, to Matthew 24. Because it's always important to look at a story in its context. What was Jesus trying to say before? That will help us to understand what he's trying to say in this particular story. Because he ends his sermon with an illustration. But he's already been speaking for a while. So let's see what Jesus was was saying. Jesus had just told his disciples that one day the temple would be destroyed. And that rocked their world. They couldn't imagine how that could ever be possible. So the disciples came up to him after he said that, and they asked him a very brilliant question. They said, tell us, when? When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now the disciples asked these questions all together because they thought that the temple wouldn't be destroyed till the end of the world. So they thought all this would happen at the same time. Jesus' response doesn't clear this up. 
He never gives away exactly when his coming would be. But what he does begin with is very important. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. That was his first thing. His disciple says, when are you coming? When is the end of the world going to be? Tell us all the details. And he says, don't let anyone trick you. That's the most important thing he wanted to say. And then Jesus gives a long list of terrible things that would take place between now and the end of the world. He says, there will be wars and rumors of wars, but that's not the end. And he says nations will rise against other nations. There will be famines, pandemics, earthquakes in various places. But he says that's, that's not the end either, just the beginning of sorrows. Many times people look around at the terrible disasters happening in the world today, and they say these are signs of the end. They are signs of the end. In fact, when Jesus... Jesus probably preached this sermon more than once. I preach sermons more than once, not in the same place, but, you know, if you want to know, maybe I shouldn't say that, but if you really have to know what I'm going to preach about before I preach it, you can always watch the Madeira live stream because they're about a month ahead <laughs> somehow. Jesus did the, same, did the same thing most likely, and when Luke recorded Jesus' sermon about this, he mentioned all these different things, the wars, the famines, the strife, all of these things as signs. But Matthew records this sermon in a way where Jesus lists all these things that are happening, but he says, but that's not it. There is one sign that Jesus is finally pointing to in this sermon, in this way that he's, he's telling that, and we're going to get to it. What is the sign? What is the one thing? But I do think it's interesting that Jesus specifically noted that the disasters like this would happen and then said, but that's not the end. So while it's true that disasters increasing in intensity all around the world, Jesus want us, wanted us to pay attention to this. But there was something else he wanted us to focus on even more, and he's getting there. The next thing Jesus mentions here is persecution, people being offended by each other, Betrayal, hatred, false prophets, lawlessness, people's love growing cold. But then he adds this line to take our attention even off of these signs. He says, but whoever endures, hupomenes, if you remember from last time, that's that word again. Whoever endures to the end will be saved. In other words, the sign of the end the one sign, are not these either. It's still coming. Then Jesus says this gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then, then the end will come. Finally, the end is about to come. And of all the things Jesus said would happen before the end times, this is the only good one in the list. The gospel would be preached in all the world. I think he saved that best one and the one we should focus on most for last. But he doesn't call it a sign yet, does he? It is a sign, but it's not the sign. And then instead of giving us exactly what would happen next, or even describing the events in detail, Jesus simply points us back to prophecies in the book of Daniel. He says there will be a time of persecution like no other and that God will shorten that time for his people's sake. But Jesus, what is the sign? Jesus' disciples want to know everything that's going to happen before it happens. You and I do too. You ever, well, maybe some of you are like this and maybe I'm like this in some ways. I think I am. But when I was a counselor at Wawona, when I was in college, uh, there was always that one kid in my cabin that wanted to know everything that was going to happen before it ever happened. You, 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 recognize, you know people like that? Kids like that? I would have the kids say, okay, what are we going to do today? I'd say, well, it's time for you to get out of bed. It's like, no, 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 but what are we going to do today? 
Oh, well, we're going to go, well, you're going to take a shower and get dressed, and then you're going to go down to Lion Call, and then we'll have breakfast. Oh, what's for breakfast? I don't know what's for breakfast, but it'll be good. Oh, okay, okay. Well, what are we doing after that? And I would have to do the whole day, through the whole thing. And then he'd say, oh, okay, fine. Then he would get out of bed and do everything he was supposed to do. <laughs> I didn't always <laughs> explain everything, especially when I realized what I said, oh, this is how this kid works well. Let's see what I can, what I can do. It'll be a day like, like yesterday, except we might go horseback riding today. You know, something like that. But humans are all like this. We want to know exactly what's going to happen before it happens, right? And that's why the disciples are like, all right, Jesus, tell us, when exactly are you going to come? What are going to be all the signs? How will we know? That way we know exactly when it's going to happen. We can be ready. But Jesus doesn't seem to think it's a good idea to say all the things that are going to happen before they happen. I think he's wise for that. If he had just laid out, he could have just laid out all the things that would happen in history. We would have said, oh, yeah, there it is. It's all going to happen. But we also would have learned something interesting way back then. It was going to be more than 2,000 years from then. And the temptation would have been for those disciples to wait and say, you know what? 2,000 years? We don't have to do too much. Let's relax. Let's, we'll be okay with this. We, we don't have to worry about telling everybody because it's 2,000 years until Jesus comes. That's why Jesus didn't give it away. <laughs> he wanted us to be ready now and whenever the day of his coming will be. But what is that one sign? Here in Luke, there's just one sign that Jesus emphasizes. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. What is the sign? And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I have to imagine Jesus smiling just a little bit when he said that. You want to know what the sign is? It's when you see me in the clouds. <laughs> Everything else are signs, of course. They're pointing that Jesus is coming. But he says, you'll know it's me when you see me coming in the sky. <laughs> Lots of things are going to happen. Pay attention to those things, Jesus says, and to what Scripture already says about the end of times. But the sign of my coming, you'll know when you see me. But pastor, you ask, what about all those other signs? The disasters, the things that Jesus mentions will take place before, aren't those the signs of the end? Well, yes. Like I said before, Luke, when he records this sermon of Jesus, he calls these things the signs. The disasters and persecutions, they're definitely signs or things that tell us that Jesus is coming soon. But what Jesus wants us to focus on is himself. His coming he wants us to watch and wait. And the most important thing that we are supposed to watch for is Jesus himself. You see, sometimes I think we get distracted by spending our time watching all the events that Jesus mentioned would happen before he came. We track all the earthquakes, all the wars, all the hatred happening in the world. We even track the spread of the gospel, all the groups of people who have and haven't been introduced to Christianity yet. And don't get me wrong, none of these are wrong to notice. In fact, Jesus goes on to explain that just like we can tell the seasons by looking at a tree's leaves, so we'll be able to know when his second coming is near. But the main sign is when he appears in the clouds. Why does Jesus emphasize this sign? It's because he wants his followers to keep their eyes on him rather than everything that's happening in the world. That's why, back to Hebrews 12, keeping our, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We fix our eyes on Jesus. 
We notice, we recognize the things that are happening in the world, but we don't make those our focus or we'll lose sight of Jesus. Let's jump down to verse 36. This is an important verse. It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In verse 42, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Verse 44, therefore you always be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Even though we can know that the second coming of Jesus is getting closer and closer by looking at the world around us, Jesus says that his coming will still be at an hour that we don't expect. And he wants us to be ready and watching. That way we won't be taken by surprise. In fact, this idea of being ready and watching is is where Jesus spends his time next. He tells five parables. Three of them specifically describe how we are supposed to wait. The first one is very short and simple. Still in chapter 40, uh, excuse me, excuse me, chapter 24, verse 43, Jesus says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Now, thieves don't usually prearrange their arrival with the occupants of the house, do they? (laughs) Imagine you got a text message and said, hey, I'm going to come rob your house at 3 in the morning tomorrow. What would you do? (laughs) Call the police and say, hey, you might want to come stake out my house at 3 in the morning. The robber's going to be here. (laughs) And then they would get caught. Jesus describes himself as coming like, quote, a thief in the night. Now, this isn't him being sinister, but he's just describing that we won't know exactly when he'll come. You don't know when someone's going to break into your house. Hopefully never. That's my hope for all of you, and me too. We don't know. We just have to be ready. What does this look like? What does it mean to be ready? The next parable talks about this also. It says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Two servants. Two servants. One servant is a faithful servant. The master says, hey, I'm going away on a long trip. I want you to take care of my stuff and my people. The first servant says, yeah, Of course I will. And he's going to be ready when his master comes back. But Jesus says, imagine that the the person, they said, hey, I'm going away on a long trip. You're in charge of the company now. And what are you going to do? Well, this guy, well, what are you going to do? Hopefully it's going to be different than what this guy did. He started to beat all the servants. He abused the people. And he went out and hung out with the, he, he would get drunk every night. He was not really taking care of the business well, was he? He was abusing the employees. But notice that this servant is not condemned simply because he observed, he noticed that the master delayed the coming. Right? That was an obvious observation. Oh, the master hasn't come yet. I imagine many of us, most of us, expected Jesus to have come a long time before 2024. Am I right? Yeah, me too. It's not wrong to look around and notice that Jesus hasn't come as soon as we expected him to. What is wrong is what we do with that realization. The servant in this parable takes advantage of that and does two things. First, he beats his fellow servants. 
He treats the people around him terribly, probably taking advantage of the fact that his master has put him in charge. And we should be cautious of falling into that trap. This servant saw that his master hadn't arrived yet, and so decided that since he was in charge, he'd do things his way. But while we wait for Jesus to come, we are called to reflect his character, both in the way that we treat other people and in the way that we live when no one is watching. Which leads us to the second thing this servant does. He, he eats and drinks with the drunkards. This isn't talking about what Jesus did when he would hang out with the, the sinners and the, other, the, the, the prostitutes and the drunkards. This, is, this, this person is joining them. He leaves his post and spends his time distracting himself from what his master has asked him to do. And revel, relevant to us today. Sometimes it's tempting to say to ourselves, well, Jesus isn't coming yet. It'll still be a while. I have time to do whatever I want. But have you ever got distracted from doing something? Looked at the time and realized you spent a lot longer than you thought? I saw a video recently of a, it was a short little clip, probably a reel. A husband and a wife. The wife leaves the house and uh, decides to, uh, no, excuse me, the wife leaves the house to go to work apparently and the husband is off that day or doesn't work, I don't know. Whatever it was, she's leaving and he's staying home and she says, hey, honey, before, before, when, before I come back, do you mind fixing that light in the bathroom? And he says, oh yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. But in this video's montage, um, we see that the husband doesn't fix the light. Instead, he watches TV, he plays video games for a while. He, and when we, the next scene we see him, he's in bed with a video game controller and lots of crumbs of chips all over the bed. <laughs> and suddenly he hears the keys and realizes that, oh, his wife came. And what did he not do? Well, he didn't do anything, but he didn't. Uh, fix that light in the bathroom. So he rushes around. He throws a blanket over the bed full of chips. So gross. Runs around and gets that light fixture. And as he's trying to get this light fixture in place before his wife comes in the house, he falls and hits his head on the ground. And he puts a, he, his wife walks in and sees her valiant husband with a cloth on his head in pain. He, he, he was injured just trying to, to fix that bathroom light. <laughs> of course, hopefully this isn't a true story, but let's be honest, I think lots of us have found ourselves doing similar things. This is what Jesus is trying to keep us from doing. Because if we try to rush around and get ready for Jesus to come as soon as we see him coming, it'll be too late. So what does he want us to do? Jesus has one more story to share on this theme, and this one is much more familiar. I should say he has three stories to share on this theme, but don't worry, we'll only talk about one today, and we'll talk about the other two next time I'm here in a couple weeks. Matthew chapter 25 now, verse 1. We finally found the wedding. Jesus starts this with the famous introduction, the kingdom of heaven is like which means this story is about what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom. How does God expect the citizens of his kingdom to act while waiting for Jesus to come? Here's the story. It says there were 12 virgins, 12 young women, who were waiting for a wedding to start. And like all weddings, I can't say all, but like most weddings, this wedding was starting just a little bit late. These 10 girls were waiting for the wedding to start. But this is a little bit different culture than us today. We have some elements of this culture still in the way we do weddings today. But see, see if you recognize these. Back then, people didn't just sit in the building or at the outdoor venue or whatever it was that the wedding was going to take place. They waited at home. Because 
in their small little village, they would hear the wedding procession come down the street, and then they'd get up and join the wedding procession to the place where the wedding would take place. So they didn't have to wait inside a church and say, oh my goodness, this wedding is taking forever to start. Maybe I should go home and eat and come back. Um, they just waited at their houses for the wedding to take place. But these 10 girls were waiting together because they were friends and they were hoping the wedding would start soon. And they waited on the streets. And in this culture, similar to ours actually, the person who started the wedding procession was the groom. Maybe your Bible version says the bridegroom. That word always threw me off as a kid because I thought, well, is it the bride or is it the groom? I don't know. <laughs> it's the groom. It's the bride's groom, I guess, is how the etymology of that phrase works. But the groom is the one who leads the wedding procession. And they're waiting for him. And today, we still have that. The, the groom is the first one up on the platform, whether he walks in from the from the back or walks in from the side, the groom is the first one. We get this from this culture. They're waiting for the groom, but there was one thing that these girls were not expecting. They weren't expecting the wedding to start late. Well, some of them weren't expecting the wedding to start late. And certainly they didn't expect it to start this late. Because by the time the groom showed up, what time was it? Midnight. Oh, don't you wish that your wedding started at midnight? No way. I think people would have gone home. Today, they'd say, oh, enough of this. It's 9 o'clock. There's not, not going to be any wedding. I'm going to go home and go to bed. Right? But these people are still waiting. And at midnight, finally, they hear the cry. The bride... Oh. I'm going to say it again. I'm saying the bridegroom is coming. The groom is coming. He's coming. And those girls had all fallen asleep, all of them, while waiting for the groom to come. I mean, you would have too, right? I think it's encouraging here that it says all of them fell asleep. Because if we're comparing ourselves to these girls, sometimes we think, oh, well, don't, don't fall asleep. But it says all of them did. The point wasn't don't fall asleep while waiting. The point is still coming. They woke up when they heard the loud procession and the trumpets going down the streets. Five of them had brought extra oil for their lamps. Today we would say extra batteries or a charging cable or maybe extra headlights if it was down the street. I don't know, but five of the girls did not have extra oil and they wouldn't be able to see where they were going. So the five that had oil put more oil in their lamps and got up to follow the wedding party. But the five that were foolish, Jesus said, begged the others and said, please, share some of your oil with us. We can't, they said, or else we might not have enough for both of us and you. But go to the store and get more oil. I don't know if the stores were open back then, but if it was a little village and they were all waiting till midnight, somebody probably had something open. So the five wise ones, the ones who were ready for anything, no matter how long the, the, the delay was, they got into the processional and went into the wedding. But the five foolish ones who weren't ready for a delay came late to the wedding and the door was already shut. And they knocked on the door. Master, master, open up the door. But the master came to the door, looked through the peephole, and said, I don't know you. I don't know if it was because they didn't get the extra oil and the light didn't show who they were, or if the master said, was thinking, you should have known I was going to be delayed. You must not know me too well. But the master says, I don't know you. And then Jesus concludes with the, the phrase, watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, lots of ink has been spilled interpreting the various aspects of this parable. There's lots of good things to read about this parable. 
But the question we're asking specifically today is, what does this parable teach us about what it means to wait for Jesus to come? I want to highlight just a few things. First, what is the difference between the wise and the foolish girls in this story? The oil? Yes. The wise ones were ready for a delay. The foolish ones were not. The wise ones expected the wedding to start late. They knew the family. (laughs) They knew it was going to start late. The foolish ones were not prepared. We preach because the Bible says that Jesus is coming soon. But we also look at history and see that we're still here. This has taken a lot longer than we thought. The mark of being ready for Jesus to come is expecting it to happen quickly but also expecting there to be a delay. The mark of being ready for Jesus to come is expecting it to happen quickly, but also expecting there to be a delay. And we know from the book of 2 Peter that the reason God delays is so that more people can be saved, as many people as possible. How long are we going to have to wait? We don't know. But a big lesson from this parable is, if you want to be ready for Jesus to come, be ready for it to happen at any time. Ready for it to be in just a few more days, but also ready for a longer delay. Second, what is it that makes us ready? The wise women in this parable brought extra oil. And often in the Bible, oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Now, this has always confused me just a little bit. Because how am I supposed to measure how much of the Holy Spirit I keep with me at all times? In fact, the Bible says that Jesus does not give his spirit by measure. But the point here is not the extra amount. The point here is that oil and lamps are symbolic of the relationship that I have with Jesus, that I have through the Holy Spirit who lives in me. Jesus wants to know me and wants me to know him. And my relationship with him needs to be one that is in it for the long run. Not a quick, oh yeah, I know you, acquaintanceship, but a long-lasting, forever friendship. And this friendship is one that will also be a light to others, which is related to the third point that I want to make. At the very end, the wise girls got into the wedding because the master knew them. The foolish girls didn't get in because the master didn't know them. Waiting for Jesus to come means using the time that we have, however short or long it may be, to get to know Jesus. That's the key. Do you know Jesus? Do you want to get to know him better? Do you want to be ready when he comes? Do you want to be ready no matter when he comes? No matter if it's later this year, sometime next year, or even if it's not in your lifetime, the key is getting to know Jesus. I want to encourage you to get to know him more. Father in heaven, we know you're coming soon. We don't know when. Help us to be ready by getting to know you as we wait for you to come help us to get to know you better so that we can have a closer more intimate relationship with you guide us to do this so that we can introduce others to someone we know and so that we can be ready for whenever you come we thank you so much and we pray that your coming is soon and that as many people as possible can be ready, and especially 
us and our families and our loved ones. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen.